good evening, everybody. Thank you for giving up your valuable time to come and see our presentations. Uh, thank you very much uh, also to Andrew for giving us a great introduction to personalised medicine, precision medicine, uh, and, and some of the aspects of cancer research. Um, so while um, Angle have the technology to identify cancer cells and, and therefore identify the genetic makeup of, of particular cancers, what we're concentrating on at Sarium is developing the drug molecules to treat those cancers. And we're very much focused on the um, genetically and biochemically driven um, targets uh, that, that are uh, features of, of particular cancers. So uh, the, the technology that um, Angle are, are developing will, will be key to the, the, the ultimate use of, of, of the drugs that, uh, that we're producing. So um, we've already alluded to, to the fact that, that cancer is becoming in increasingly common. Uh, the, the, the rather bad news is, is over half of us uh, are likely to be diagnosed with cancer at some time in our life. Um, the, the, the slightly better news is that we're much better at treating it now. We, with with did early detection and better use of the uh, uh, perhaps you know, still blunt instruments of, of chemo and radiotherapy, uh, survival rates have doubled in the UK um, in the last 40 years. And, and I think with, with the new generation of personalised medicines that are beginning to come through, and we've talked about Herceptin uh, and drugs like that, um, then, then we'd expect those rates to, uh, to increase. And, and even if cancer can't actually be cured, it can be converted from, a, I, I suppose, a, a death sentence to a manageable disease, and, and, and maybe that's a, a goal we're looking for. Uh, and from a commercial point of view, cancer drugs are, are, are expected to be the biggest selling therapeutic area, so, so a market of of 80 billion by, by 2017, and, and that's very much driven by these new personalised medicines that are coming through. Uh, I think I win the prize for the biggest disclaimer here, um, so, so let's quickly pass on. We'll obviously um, draw your attention to, to the announcement that was made before about, uh, uh, about what you hear today. Uh, so let me quickly introduce Sarium then. So we're a drug discovery and development company. Uh, we are looking to, I suppose, do the inventive, the creative part of drug discovery and then out-license the, the fruits of our research to pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and I'll talk about what I mean by uh, the, the preclinical and early clinical stage, perhaps at a, a late event stage. But um, so, so w but we do the inventive step of designing the molecules that make up the active ingredient of, of, of a pharmaceutical drug. Um, we'll formulate them. Uh, we'll look to do some early clinical trials in patients, and I'll talk about uh, our timetable for doing that. Uh, and then ultimately, we'll look to license to a pharmaceutical major company who, who's much better placed to do the big clinical trials. We heard uh, earlier today that, that a phase three clinical trial, for instance, uh, might involve up to 1,000 patients. That, that's just far too big an expense, too much time and too much risk for, for us to take on. Uh, the big pharma companies uh, are much, much better placed to do that. And obviously, we don't have the marketing muscle in place, but again, being a small company, uh, to, to take drugs onto the market, that, that's really the job of the big pharma companies. Uh, our focus is on cancer. We also have a, an autoimmune disease program, which I'll briefly touch on. Um, the company is based on uh, the expertise in drug discovery and development of, of, of particularly the, the executive directors, of which I'm one, uh, and I'll bring up our bios on the next slide. Uh, I'll talk about our flexible, uh, cost-effective uh, research model. So, uh, it, in, in short, um, we work out of an office. We have no laboratories of our own. Uh, we design the molecules, so, so think about what molecules to make, how they should be tested, and then commission all that work in laboratories of research providers throughout the world. So, typically, the UK, the US, and China are our, our biggest sources of research precision. Um, either on a cash for research basis, so, so no IP um, uh, resides with, with, with the partner there, or on a uh, collaboration basis, and, and this is a recent development for us that we've entered into collaboration so that we can progress uh, three programs uh, forward, um, so, 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 so to minimise the risk of, of a single failure, and drug discovery is a risky business, unfortunately, um, and, and therefore... Um, uh, an amount of licensing rights or, or, or revenue streams uh, is shared with a partner on that, but it, but it enables us to um, progress our research on, on three fronts um, without a huge cash overhead on us. Uh, I'll talk about our drug candidates. Um, I'll mention our co-development partners as, as we go through. Uh, they're, they're listed here. Uh, it's the Cancer Research Technology Pioneer Fund. So this is an investment arm set up by Cancer Research UK. Um, 
and working in collaboration with the Institute of Cancer Research. So this is a major research unit based at the Royal Marsden Hospital uh, in Surrey. Uh, we have a collaboration with um, SRI International. This is a California-based uh, government-funded, so it's a not-for-profit not research group uh, with, with a long history of, of working in, in medical research. And then a collaboration with Hebei Medical University in China. Uh, so, so this is a, a company that's focused on generic drugs and traditional Chinese medicine, but looking to get into innovative um, new molecule drugs. Uh, and, and that's a, I'll, I'll talk about that collaboration um, in, in, in another slide. Um, key to what we do is based on our, our patent protection. So what we ultimately license onto a pharmaceutical company is, is the patent that, that describes the, the drug molecule and its use. And, and that essentially protects anybody from copying uh, what we're doing. And obviously that, that's uh, very, very important to us. And we have patents that are, are, are granting uh, or have granted and, and, and continue to grant in, in the US, Europe, China. So all the major territories we're covering. Um, and I suppose the pretty much the ultimate test of, of the solidity of your IP as, as will the authorities grant that patent and, and that's happening to us, uh, um, well it has been happening for the last few years. Uh, I won't mention our drug discovery platform in this short presentation. Uh, I'll quickly mention um, the directors and their bios. Uh, so I've been working in pharmaceutical research for 25 years. Um, Smith Klein Beecham is, I guess, where I learned my trade. Now, now GSK. In fact, I'm old enough to, for, for the company to have been Beecham when I first started, um, and, and then worked my way up through uh, a, a number of biotech companies. Um, if any of you remember the biotech company Alizyme uh, from a few years ago, um, slightly unfortunate story, but um, the one remaining product they had at their uh, uh, at their closure was a drug called Cetilostat. It's an obesity treatment. Um, I, invented for that, uh, I invented that for them while I was uh, working at Cambridge Discovery Chemistry here. They, they contracted that research out to that company. Uh, so I was a project manager and an inventor of that drug. That's been approved for market in Japan now. Uh, and I guess there's some plans for worldwide approval somewhere, but it's um, way out of my hands now. Uh, John Reeder, our chief scientist. Uh, again, a long history in biotech and um, uh, small drug discovery companies. Uh, Paul Harper, you may be aware of. Um, he used to be CEO of Cambridge Antibody Technology. I'll mention them again uh, in a future slide. Um, he's a non-exec at Reneuron, um, who you may be familiar with. Physiomics is another company he's involved in. And our advisory board, Harry Finch, Bob Jackson, both have long careers in pharma and biotech. So why is a small company like us um, wor working in drug research, which has, I suppose, typically been the domain of um, the large pharmaceutical companies, the GSKs and the AstraZenecas? Uh, and, and the answer is these big companies are increasingly looking to small biotechs, such as ourselves, um, to in-license their drug candidates. Can this really be happening, uh, you may ask? Well, if you consider uh, Humira, the world's biggest selling drug, uh, that was developed at Cambridge Antibody Technology, so it's so a small Cambridge company that, that I've mentioned earlier, uh, licensed out to pharmaceutical majors, um, Abbott, I believe, uh, now sells at $8 billion a year. So that, there's, that, that's one example, and, and there's many of them, where um, the creative step of drug discovery has been done in a small biotech and then gets licensed out to a major pharmaceutical company and then becomes a, a, a top selling drug. Uh, the big pharmaceutical companies then um, ha are, excuse me, uh, are about to lose a, a great deal of their sales because the, the patents covering these drugs are due to expire. Uh, the pipelines that they have uh, in place, um, so, um, what by pipelines, I'm not referring back to the oil industry, the, the, this is the, the, the drugs they have in development uh, are insufficient um, to, to replace those lost sales. Um, so, so they're increasingly looking to biotech companies such as us to refill those pipelines. Uh, indeed, 50% of pharmaceutical uh, pipelines are now externally sourced from biotech's academia and the rest of the world. And that's increasing. I mean, 10 years ago, it was 20 or 30%. Uh, some companies uh, are, are declaring something like 60% uh, of their pipeline being ex externally sourced. So there's a great opportunity uh, for biotech companies um, to d d do what they do best and then, then license on for um, considerable license payments to, um, to pharmaceutical companies. So the question then is, when, when should we 
do that handover process? How far down the track should we go before we hand over our, our products to the pharmaceutical companies? Uh, I think typically for biotech, it's been at the end of this so-called phase two testing. Um, so uh, in, in terms of getting a drug to market, you, you, you run a, a, a short uh, or a, a small phase one trial to show that the, uh, the product is, is effective. Uh, in cancer, without getting too much detail, you can also show some sort of efficacy. So we're look, primarily looking for safety. You start to look at efficacy here. You do a big efficacy trial here, uh, and then you can uh, go through the, the, the regulatory authorities to get it onto market. Um, the problem here in, 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 in phase two is, is the failure rates are actually quite high, something like 60%. Uh, and I think for a small company like us, that, that's just a little bit risky for us to, uh, to take on. So, so we're looking to, to, to license in and around the phase one stage. Um, the license deals that we, we can get are, are still, um, still worthwhile at that phase. So, so the, the, um, the, the blue column on the left here is looking at the upfront payments for a licensing deal at various stages. Phase one, uh, we're looking at uh, actually, actually median rather than average, but it's uh, a typical deal size of 15 to 20 million dollars up front, and then in terms of milestones down the track, of the order of, of, of several hundred million. So, so as the, the pharma company takes the, the, the product through uh, the various clinical trial stages, payments come back to, to the biotech company for that. And then there's a sales royalty on top. So there's, there's good deal sizes at phase one. Obviously they are bigger if you go down the track to, to phase two. But we're, we're looking at this, these near-term phase one space as our ideal place to partner. Okay, so, so that's, that's setting the scene of, of why we're in business. I've got three short slides on the, 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 the three main drug programs that we're running at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm keeping it technology light. There's far more technical information on our website uh, if you want to, to, to look at the, 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 the underlying science behind uh, what we're doing in more detail. Um, actually, I'll, I'll, put, I'll, I'll just explain one quick buzzword here. You'll see this word kinase uh, come up a few times. This is a, a, a piece of body biochemistry that uh, is used in so-called cell signaling. So this is transmitting something that a cell senses from the outside into its nucleus. Typically, it'll be a, a signal for the, the cell to grow and divide. And these, this signaling is, is often um, over-switched on in cancer cells. So, so it, it's, it's uh, picking up perhaps weak signals from the outside, transmitting the, uh, converting those into a strong signal to grow and divide. And this, this causes this, this the growth and, and, and size of a tumour. Uh, so if we interrupt this signalling by essentially gumming up the biochemistry in, in these kinase enzymes, that's, that's shown to be an effective treatment uh, for, for many types of cancer. Um, in this case, this so-called checkpoint kinase 1, um, the, the, the role here is to make chemo and radiotherapy more effective. So um, cancer cells treated with, with chemo and radio can, can stop what they're doing. They can um, repair the damage that chemo and radiotherapy causes um, and uh, es essentially become resistant to the, uh, to, to the treatment they've been given. This repair mechanism is controlled by this checkpoint kinase 1 biochemistry. So if we co-administer uh, something to stop the checkpoint kinase 1 along with chemotherapy, uh, then the rationale is that should have a benefit to patients. We've demonstrated this in, in models of uh, lung, colon, and pancreatic cancer, so we, we haven't got it into patients yet, but, but, but in the laboratory tests we've done so far, uh, we, we see that it may well work in, in these cancers, uh, and this will be the, the primary target of the phase one trial that we're looking to start at the beginning of, the, of next year. So, so we're hoping to see, I suppose, a transformation in, in the... Uh, in our company, it, when we transfer from this discovery laboratory-based stage to a clinical stage where, where we're actually treating our products uh, in cancer patients. So we're looking to uh, start the approval process later on this year, uh, start our first clinical trials in uh, early next year. Uh, a second program here is, is specifically targeting um, leukemia and lymphoma, and, and this is very much one of the um, precision medicines uh, that we heard about in the previous uh, presentation. So this so-called FLT3 kinase is, is a, uh, a mutation in this enzyme often occurs in um, acute myeloid leukemia. So it, it's 
the, uh, the most common mutation, it's something like about 30% of, of AML patients uh, will have this mutation in this so-called FLT3 kinase. Um, and, and, again, and I suppose a genetic test uh, to uh, identify those patients either before treatment or before trials would be very, very, very valuable. I mean, I think at the moment it can be done, but it, it, it's a pretty slow and involved process. Um, we also talked about um, in the previous presentation how um, cancers can be heterogeneous or heterogeneous and all can mutate. So, so what you think the genetic makeup of a cancer when you first diagnose it may not be the case after several rounds of treatment. Um, and certainly for um, competitor FLT3 kinase uh, programs that are in, in the clinic, um, resistance to that treatment is beginning to show up. Um, and we're looking to overcome that by also uh, taking out uh, a second piece of, of, of cancer bi or, or biochemistry that's uh, important in cancer cells, so-called aurora kinase. So the rationale here is that um, if we treat uh, leukemia patients with the, uh, the, com the, the combined aurora and FLT3 kinase drug, then any resistance to FLT3 uh, will be overcome by uh, the additional aurora kinase activity. Um, again, we validated the, uh, the molecule in model studies. Um, in this case, um, we had, a, I suppose, as good as we could get for, uh, as good as we could hope for results in that 10 out of the 10 uh, mice that we tested had no detectable tumour after three cycles of treatment, and, and that's pretty much as good as, good as you can get uh, uh, for, for this sort of trials. Our partner here is uh, Hebei Medical University Biomedical Engineering Centre in China. Um, the way this collaboration is working is that they will fully fund the preclinical development. So, so the, the next stage up to readiness for clinical trials is entirely funded by, um, uh, by HMU. Uh, in return, they get the Chinese market. So it, it's, we, we get uh, an awful lot of free research. It, it'll be over a million pounds worth of work uh, in return for a market which we can't really address anyway as, as a small company. So it, it's very much a win-win a situation. And we're looking to file for clinical trials um, mid to late next year, with all the health warnings of, 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 of the, 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 the process that's drug discovery. Uh, finally, I'll talk about our TIC2 kinase programs. So, so this is uh, an autoimmune disease target. Um, so autoimmune diseases are diseases where the, the body attacks itself. Uh, so uh, things like multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, psoriasis, uh, th these are all examples of autoimmune disease uh, where we think this so-called TIC2, uh, well, so where TIC2 kinase is an important part of the pathway that leads to this um, disease state. Uh, and, and again, the rationale is, is that if you, if you take out the action of, of TIC2 kinase, that then you'll bring down normal uh, cell signaling and, and normal cell activity. Our collaboration partners here are, are SRI International. Um, they have a, a, a strong... Uh, expertise in autoimmune disease biology, and, and that's very valuable to us. Our expertise is in chemistry and in cancer, uh, so we, we were very keen to find uh, a partner with the expertise in autoimmune disease biology for this. Uh, so in this collaboration, uh, they fund the biology part, uh, which they do in-house, we fund the chemistry, and then there's a revenue share on commercialization, which is under our control. Uh, We've validated so far in models of psoriasis and multiple sclerosis. We're looking to do inflammatory bowel disease. We're looking at things like lupus, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis later down the track, hopefully, uh, hopefully this year. And then recently, there's also a cancer indication. Uh, T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a leukemia that primarily affects adolescents. Uh, and this is thought to be TIC2 driven. And, and we're starting to investigate uh, how we might turn that into, into a cancer treatment. And this is independent of, of SRI, so, so this is enti entirely under our control. I'll have a quick slide on funding here. Um, so we, I've talked about our very lean business model. I've talked about how our collaborations enable us to run um, three programs in parallel without having to put all our eggs in, basket, in one basket. Uh, I think we've seen that Drug discovery can be a risky business. I, mean, I suppose risk in terms of failure, risk in terms of, of time delaying, having, having to go round and round uh, the research cy cycles again. So we thought it was important to, to be able to run all our programs on, on the uh, perhaps somewhat limited budget uh, that we currently have. So, so we, we engage these, our collaboration partners. Uh, 
But if you dissect out our figures, th this is for the year to June 2014, you can see that uh, essentially two-thirds of our spend is on, on research and development. And I suppose this, this is very typical of a, a small biotech. If you compare that to a pharmaceutical company, it's kind of 10, 15, 20 percent of, of their, their total spend will be on, on R&D. Um, we, we look for grant funding whenever, wherever we can get it. Uh, there's a scheme put in by the government called Biomedical Catalyst, absolutely excellent scheme. Competition for its red hot. Uh, last year, we, we received 150,000 in grants. Um, tax credits also work very well for us. Uh, I think I I in our history to date, we've raised over a million pounds uh, in R&D tax credits, or sort of raised, had, had a million pounds returned to us. Uh, and when you consider uh, that we've actually only raised 10 million in, in our 10 year history, um, then, then obviously they're very important to us. Um, I talked about our Check One program and our uh, expected clinical trials. Um, for this, we, we, we have a spending commitment of £800,000. We, we put it into a, a joint collaboration pot, and, and then that's drawn down as, as, uh, as the program needs it. Uh, and we will be looking for finance later in the year uh, to, to, to fund this trial, but we th I think we see this as a very important step for us and, and I think something that will, will give us a, a, a big increase in realised value uh, because we, 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 we make that transformation from a, a discovery stage to a, a clinical trial and development stage company and, and we're, much, we're, we're that much closer to, to the point where pharmaceutical companies are looking to licence. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll quickly talk about uh, news flow then uh, with all the health warnings that drug discovery is a risky business. Uh, d delays are kind of inevitable uh, and, and failure, rates, you know, failure does happen, unfortunately. Uh, I've talked about our, our uh, check one plans, so, so we, we will have, uh, we'll have data out there and, and we'll have the, the clinical trial application in uh, hopefully later this year, clinical trials starting next year. Uh, Aurora Flit, uh, as, as we... Um, progress through the, the preclinical development stage. Again, we'll have data there to report uh, and hopefully looking for uh, clinical trials applications um, next year. Uh, and similarly for TIC2, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, although it's an earlier stage program, the, 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 we'll have the data through hopefully on, on the new disease models uh, coming out later this year. Uh, so in summary then, um, we're progressing our drug discovery. Uh, we're on budget on our research plan, but we're looking for that transformation, uh, which we see is very important to us, from discovery stage to clinical development stage. Uh, so position ourselves as a clinical st stage development company, uh, have our first application this year, uh, and our first trial starting beginning, uh, early next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, any hands up? Any questions? At the back? I just wanted to ask, um, usually when these pharmaceutical companies then look to license you, uh, the first thing they have to do is redo the clinical trial because the size was very small. How do you know that's going to be different for yourself? Okay, um, so, so, so I suppose, well, certainly one advantage for, for, for the Check One trial we have, but by doing this in partnership, so sharing the cost, um, we'll, we'll be running that clinical trial to large pharmaceutical company standards. So, so we're not expecting that one to be one that they'll, they'll look at and think, oh, well, that, you know, it's far too small. Uh, for, for, I suppose for our use, we'd have to go back and start again. We'll, 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 we'll run a full-on trial, uh, which I guess we can afford, uh, because that cost will be shared with, with our partners uh, from, from Cancer Research Technology. Um, it, broadly speaking, and I dare say it's um, not easy to give a precise number, but getting to that phase one point where the large pharmaceutical companies will look at a, a drug development, from start to that... Um, kind of key moment, more or less, what does that cost per drug or, 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 or per molecule development? Uh, so, 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 that's, so, so, so there's an interesting one, isn't it? I, I mean, it, it obviously depends on failure rates. I suppose, I mean, you, you could say from, from, from our experience, we've got, I mean, we, well, yeah, we, we've, I'm trying to think exactly how we did because I suppose from our case, we, we, we've done many in collaboration, so it's difficult mm. to tease out exactly which ones. I would say of the order of £5 million. Pounds. Okay. Um, it's, it's that kind of amount. So in, in, without being flippant, it's, not, it's relatively modest money. It, it, it's not huge uh, Sorry, sorry. So, so that, that's to get from where we are today, yeah. yes. And, and then, I, yes, I should think you, you could spend a, a million to, to get to trials approval and then two or three million for the trial, it's that sort of thing, yeah. So, 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 so maybe to get, you know, to get to the end of phase one, 
for, for a biotech which is much more cash efficient than a, um, a large pharmaceutical company, I would say the order of 10 million. Okay. Question here, thank you. Hi there. Um, as you explained about um, all the, the, the research drug, as well as um, uh, explained about like um, you've got your government funding, whether it's here and in America and China, I just want to, when it comes to something like an austerity rules that comes onto you and you don't feel a bit like ring fenced, will it affect, or your grants may have been downsized, will it affect your uh, research work and drug t treatment? Um, well, I, uh, I think, um, I mean, certainly in the UK, you know, the biobendical catalyst is being expanded. I mean, I mean it, it's way oversubscribed. And, and yes, I mean, you know, if we apply for a grant and don't get it, then, then sure, it does slow things down. I think in China, there's a, there's huge amounts of, of government money uh, coming in for, for innovative, innovative drug treatments, and, and, and which is why HMU are looking for us. Um, so I, I, I don't see that drying out. Uh, in, in the US, uh, I'm, yes, I mean, the, the NIH grants that fund uh, organizations such as SRI are harder and harder to come by at, at the moment, so uh, that's certainly true. Any other questions from the floor? Um, I've had a quick one then. Um, of the three projects that you have in development at the moment, um, Whilst I'm sure they're all exciting, is there one that you think um, is the one that you, th you, you think is really the, the, the one, or, or are they all differently? Um... I, I think I've been quoted as saying this before, actually. I mean, of course we love all our children equally. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, I suppose because Czech one is, 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 that, is the one that's, that, that's closest to clinical trials, then, then I think that's the one uh, that, that we've got, and, and I think many of our investors have got their eye on, even though we, own, we, we don't, you know, we own a a smaller share of it than, than, than the other uh, programs. I, th I think because it's our first one to, to cross that all important line that you know, we're, you know, we obviously give that close attention. But I think you know, I mean, all the programs were originated at Sarium. So you know, it's not like we, we, we adopted uh, programs from, um, from other organizations. So, so, so they're all essentially our, our homegrown programs. So, so we, we're, we're very much, you know, I suppose, attached and supportive of them. But I guess the most advanced is obviously the one that attracts the most attention. Um, and on the financials, a question asked by a gentleman earlier, um, do, do you have any institutions or um, are, you, are you almost, prince, almost entirely a retail um, uh, So we're pretty much all retail. I mean, the, the, um, uh, myself and, and the, the other directors own 5% of the company. Uh, the rest is, uh, yeah, amongst retail investors. Okay. Yeah.